Testing. All right. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Universal Postal Union's lightning talk on the postal sector's role in the global digital economy. We are still waiting on one of our guests to arrive, but I don't want to keep everyone waiting, especially our colleagues online, why that happens. So I will improvise by introducing and hopefully playing a bit of her role if I can. We're missing the UN um, Tech Envoy's um, representative, UN Office of the Technology uh, Envoy. Um, so Universal Postal Union, uh, how many of you know who, what the UPU is? Does anybody know about the UPU? Yes, Do you know it's, it's the Universal Postal Union and it is the organization that basically looks after the interests of the, post, the global postal sector. So it was the, it is the second oldest international organization in the world, founded in 1874. And it is right now in its um, current effort trying to drive digital transformation within the postal sector. So as part of that, we decided to have a workshop today to introduce um, our colleagues online, yourselves who are here with us today, to the United Nations Global Digital Compact, which is a project of the United Nations Secretary General, part of the Summit of the Future, part of the whole strategy of the next step for the, the world going forward, our global common agenda. And I was hoping that our colleague from the Tech Envoy's office will help us explain that a bit. So in the absence of doing that, I would um, probably try to begin by asking, yes, not, not just not here yet, asking our colleagues if they could assist with their understanding of how they think the digital transformation agenda of the world should work with the postal sector within that transformation process. It will not be the center of it, but as you know, the postal sector has been one of the oldest communications organizations in the world. They have been sending documents a long time before email. And now they are in this challenging situation that letters, other forms of communication are being digitized and not being sent to the post. However, the postal sector is the agency, one of the agencies that would send your things, your packages, your parcels, when you buy stuff online. So they're integrally involved in this digital transformation process. So what would you see as a role of the postal sector regarding digital transformation in the world? And as you may be aware, the postal sector in many parts of the world also provides access to government services through telecenters, access centers, or the post offices generally. So my name is Tracy Hackshaw, which I forgot to let you know. And I'm um, the dot post business manager for the Universal Postal Union. And I'm going to introduce you to our guest today. So on my immediately to my right, Rodney Taylor, Secretary General Rodney Taylor. He's the Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. And when he speaks, he'll probably give you a brief background on himself. And Hannah Arya Selassie, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Ethiopost which is Ethiopian Postal Services Enterprise, Enterprises. Yeah, thank you. So these are our two guests um, currently, and I'm going to now ask talk show format, my colleague Rodney, what does he think about the Global Digital Compact, the future of digital transformation, and his perspective as to how perhaps the, not so much the postal sector, the role of countries, maybe in the developing world, can play in this transformation process. Rodney. Thank you. Good morning, Rodney Taylor. I'm based in Trinidad and Tobago, and the organization I head is an intergovernmental organization established by CARICOM Heads of Government 
1989 with a focus on harmonizing telecommunications policy. So in this discussion, I, I'm representing the telecommunications and digital, uh, the ICT component of this discussion. So my background isn't in post, but um, I will get a bit more into how I have started to connect the two postal services and, and uh, digital transformation based on my own experience working in the government of Barbados as the chief digital technology officer, and in particular, the opportunities that COVID-19 presented uh, to, for us to collaborate more closely with the postal service. Um, with respect to the global digital compact, um, it is, there's growing, I mean, in light of this IGF, which is in its 17th year, uh, coming out of the World Summit on the Information Society, there is the, there, Tracy, I think we want to welcome our, that's fine. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, welcome. You want to have it just, okay. Um, so <clears throat> there is a recognition that yes, it is useful to have a discussion uh, around internet governance issues. And as you see from our, your attendance here, if this is your first IGF or perhaps not, that there's so many different components, so many different. So it's echoing. Are we good? Yeah, okay. So there's so many different, uh, when we talk about the internet, there, you know, there's issues of human rights and issues of gender equality. Uh, issues of youth involvement, issues of connectivity, issues of cybersecurity. Um, really, how do we move forward almost uh, at the global level with a collective agreement on how the future of the internet, how the internet should evolve for, fu for future generations under the auspices of a body like the United Nations, which is, um, I guess, in terms of uh, an international organization uh, it has the respect of, of, of governments, of private sector, and so on. So the Global Digital Compact is about how we move forward collectively uh, to in, with respect to internet and digital development in the interests of all, all mankind. Uh, and again, but you know, you can probably give more, more in-depth discussion. Now, in terms of the um, digital transformation and the, the work with the Postal Service in the pandemic, um, as I work with the government of Barbados, obviously, like many countries, there was the lockdown, many government departments were closed, critical services could not be accessed. Simple things like renewing a driver's license, for example, which you needed to do. Um, uh, and in fact, some persons could not function, could not work because their job involved driving and, and they were not able to renew. And in very short order, we were able to work with the postal service to, first of all, digitize the application process for your driver's license, renewal of your driver's license. Um, providing 24 hour access to that process. And then working with the postal service to integrate to their systems to allow for the delivery. So they would receive notification uh, picked up by the, the uh, postal service and delivered to your door. And in fact, it was sort of an aha moment. And, and very recently we have a, uh, one of our Caribbean prime ministers who said, we really ought to bring services to people as opposed to bringing people to services. So I think what the postal service represents is sort of a community-based and an opportunity um, service and an opportunity for governments to bring services closer to people. So service centers, you spoke about that, uh, the, the, the delivery once you're um, um, interacting with government in a digital environment, it provides an opportunity for end-to-end -end digital. So you apply, you pay, it is brought to your door. That is a model that Estonia, for example, has used for, for many, many years. Uh, services are brought. I've had people who in Estonia who said, I don't know where the government offices are. I can't, I don't know, I've never been to them, right? And I think this is sort of the model going forward that, and we need postal service to enable that. Beyond that, it's an opportunity for, for persons, for example, who are unbanked uh, for postal to allow them to, um, um, access digital wallets, for example, um, to act, to onboard them for digital services. In Barbados, uh, the postal service provides a service for persons, for example, to apply for a US M uh, visa, uh, where they may not have a credit card or where, where they may not have the digital skills to do it. And if you've ever applied for a US visa, 
um, it takes, you know, it could take an hour or, or more. It, it's just very complicated um, if you're not tech savvy in particular. So I'll just, those are just a few examples I wanted to give of the connection and um, based on my own experience. Thanks. Thank you, Rodney, very much. And that was actually excellent, an excellent introduction. And he was actually subbing for you. Um, this is Yu Ping Chan. She is from the UN Office of the um, Secretary, the UN Secretary General's Office of the Technology Envoy. And she will give us uh, her take on the Global Digital Compact. But what I would like to do is Rodney has already started talking about the postal sector and how it fits into the GDC. So can I ask you to, having heard what we're gonna hear from, from um, the CEO of Ethiopia Post now, when you hear that, come back and kind of, I think it might be a nice way to deal with it. So let me ask um, the CEO of Ethiopia Post, Hannah Arisalassi, so give us a brief introduction to yourself and perhaps follow up from Rodney as to what do you see, like directly speaking, you are the CEO of a post um, in a country that is, there may be some challenges with the whole change in, um, you know, letters and parcels and, you know, revenue going down. What do you see as a role of the postal sector in the global digital economy? Thank you, Tracy. Uh, so my name is Hanna. I'm the CEO of ETO Post. It's one of the oldest uh, postal operators in the country. We're the designated postal operator um, responsible for providing basic postal services throughout the territory of Ethiopia. So to speak to your question, I think I'd like to start by uh, maybe explaining why we're talking about the postal sector in the context of a, a digital economy. Because especially for people outside the postal sector, it may not be immediately apparent how the two can, can work together because it's typically considered as a threat to the postal sector rather than uh, the two working together. Uh, but I think especially looking at one of the teams under the uh, Global Digital Compact, the idea of connecting people and safeguarding human rights is very much aligned with the postal sector's uh, responsibility to provide universal postal services within the territory. So in, in that sense, I think there is an essential alignment between the postal sector and the digital economy. And I think uh, given the, the extensive network that the postal uh, operators have throughout the country, we have a global uh, network of more than 650,000 uh, branches uh, and ETO Post has, for example, 700 branches throughout the country. So I think I, I would like to think of the, the network as a sort of railway tracks on which you can always add additional services. So in that sense, when we talk about uh, the digital economy and providing inclusive, inclusive uh, services to uh, rural communities, otherwise unreached communities, the postal sector becomes one of the essential partners uh, in this agenda. Um, so, so starting from that, the postal sector can play a very important role in, uh, in realizing a, uh, the digital economy. One is in relation to uh, creating this uh, enabling environment. So if you think of uh, digital ID, digital payments, uh, and, and Ronnie just mentioned bringing the services to the people. When we talk about e-government services, uh, the idea is the postal sector, given its extensive network and, and considerable reach uh, throughout the community, would be an ideal network through which all and any government services can be provided to the citizens. So it can uh, be a bridge between uh, the government and citizens and other residents for any kind of interactions between the two. That's one area. And then uh, the other is regarding e-commerce. Uh, a lot of uh, our uh, transactions are moving online. And in that process, given the network plus the years of experience that the postal sector has in terms of handling logistics and parcels and, uh, and packages, that's another major area that the postal sectors can play a very important role in. And recognizing this uh, ETO post, we've also been uh, preparing ourselves to uh, realize the uh, digital transformation within Ethiopia. We've been working closely with uh, UPU as part of the Ecom Africa project um, to make sure that our operational processes are optimized and ready to to handle e-commerce transactions, that's, uh, that's the first step. And then we're secondly looking at the uh, digital readiness and payment readiness. So through all of this, we're uh, working to make sure that first of all, our own internal services are, are digitalized. And secondly, we're partnering up with uh, the relevant stakeholders within government and outside uh, to make sure that we are optimizing the already existing extensive network and years of experience to realize the digital transformation. Thank you very much. And again, I think that was another excellent take on the role of the postal sector in the digital economy. However, now that we have a good perspective as to how the post can play a role, what is this digital compact thing? People are talking about it. There's a summit of the future. 
Um, we've heard about the digital cooperation agenda of the Secretary General. We're here in the IGF now. Yuping, how can the post play a role in this overarching digital compact, global digital compact? What exactly is it? And how can a post play a role? Thank you so much, Tracy. And first, let me start by apologizing for coming late. I was actually with the IGF leadership panel that's meeting with the USG of DESA at this current moment to talk about a little bit about the Global Digital Compact and the role of the IGF. And let me start by saying that the Global Digital Compact is really the Secretary General's vision of how we as an international community can come together, not just governments, but also stakeholders, civil society, the technical community, private sector, posts, other sectors of society to really agree on the principles for the digital future that we want. The Secretary General has said that this needs to be open, free, secure, inclusive for everyone. And this means that we need to look at the various components of the digital future, including the digital economy, digital transformation, the dark side of digital technologies. I think you've heard quite a lot about the potential dangers and risks and challenges as well. But in this overall picture of what it is exactly that we're aspiring to create, in terms of the virtual and online world, we really need to have a broad perspective on all these important elements. And so I think exactly what Rodney and Hannah have said, that when we look at posts and the contribution to the digital economy, the implication for areas such as connectivity, for inclusion, for government services, we really go to the heart of what we want to create in our digital future, right? We want to empower individuals and communities and make sure that it's ultimately for the flourishing of individuals and communities. It's linked to sustainable development goals. The UN has really affirmed that this is part of Agenda 2030 and making sure that digital is put at the service of people and communities everywhere. So even as we address the challenges of digital technology, we also need to realize the potential benefits, the transformative power of digital as well. And then posts, I think in particular, are a very concrete example of how this can take place. And this is why I've been actually very excited and very honored to have been part of the Universal Postal Union's consideration of how it can contribute to the Global Digital Compact. So I understand, for instance, the UPU has already initiated this consultation process within the UPU, creating this as part of the existing digital innovation group, really consulting its various stakeholders on precisely the elements that colleagues have been talking about. How is it that we can incorporate these very practical perspectives in terms of the posts and their experiences to relate to these broader issues that Ronnie had mentioned, human rights, connectivity, inclusion, and so forth. So those very practical ways of looking at what does it mean to have an inclusive digital transformation, an inclusive and oriented towards development digital economy will be very important perspectives when it comes to the Global Digital Compact so that we can realize concretely how we as the international community need to work towards these collective goals. So it's really been a pleasure to be part of this conversation. I'm very happy to talk about some of these elements a little bit further if there are any specific questions on the Global Digital Compact. But this is to say that I think this conversation here and a lot of what's going on in other parts of the IGF where there are these types of considerations as well, how do particular areas of work, thematics, or perhaps the contribution of particular sectors of civil society or stakeholders, industry or technical communities contribute to the UN's consideration of the Global Digital Compact is very important. So we at the United Nations are very glad that the IGF has taken on this Global Digital Compact and the contribution that it can make as a multi-stakeholder community representing this diversity of views and voices and making sure that this is part of the global discussions on the Global Digital Compact. I'll end by saying that we are based in New York. So we hear a lot about what the New York community things. And this tends to be a little bit of a UN bubble. And it's precisely conversations like this occurring in different places with different actors that are so valuable and important in for informing the holistic picture of what it is that the international community needs to do if the digital future we want is truly to be open, inclusive, secure, and free, and for everyone, everywhere, all countries around the world. Thank you very much, Yuping. And I think that was a re another really good um, segue and introduction into what we're going to do now which is really get into the consultation process. I know it's not a lot of time, but we do have about 15 to 20 minutes that we can feel some interaction with, with yourselves and our colleagues online. So what I'd like to do now, I'm hoping that you guys will be able to feel some of these um, questions or, or, or comments. Open up the floor, Talbot, I'll give you my mic and ask you here and online um, also, recognizing my colleague Juan Moroni from the UPU, who's online, who's moderating online, to indicate what exactly do you think the postal sector can do in driving 
the digital agenda, driving digital transformation. Can the post survive this? Is it a party to the process or can it be a leader in the process? What are your thoughts about that? So open the floors open for comments, questions, interaction, engagement. And don't be shy. Just raise your hand and I will come to you with the mic or let's see if there's anything happening online. I don't know if we will get the online um, moderator to say anything, but um, there's a question in the room and you could just tell us your name and what your thoughts are. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you to the panelists. Really great start to the discussion here. My name is Christine Soon from the International Telecommunication Union. And I would like to hear the panelists' uh, thoughts about using the wide network of post offices across Ethiopia, as we could hear, uh, for example, uh, to expand connectivity for all and how we can make that happen. I would just love to hear about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, very good question. So when we think about the digital economy, the infrastructure is one of the, the major pillars. And in that, when we think about connectivity, there are many ways through which the post can uh, increase access to connectivity. And in Ethiopia, for example, we've had a, a good experiment partnering with the national telecom operator, setting up ICT centers in rural areas for the use to have access. So we're, we're in the process of uh, uh, gathering the learnings from that to come up with better models to um, increase connectivity. This is especially important in a country like Ethiopia, where the significant part of the population is still in rural areas and where the postal offices have a, a comparative advantage because of our network. So uh, we're looking at ways of leveraging that network and our presence throughout the country to see how we can uh, create access. And there are uh, many other successful examples in other countries where postal offices set up uh, IT centers and, and other modalities through which especially rural and otherwise uh, unreached communities can be included in, in the connectivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Anybody online? Let's go. I have Nigel Casimir. I know this guy. Nigel. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Nigel Casimir from the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. My question might be a little more for UPU than, than, than the panelists as well on this. Just following this track about um, using the post offices to distribute uh, access and also for, for delivery and so on. From your global perspective at the UPU, are you seeing most of the, of the postal services being still government owned and controlled? Or is there a trend to more commercial type operations? Because I'm wondering if it, if it's mostly government owned and controlled, is there a challenge to get the resources to do these sort of um, developments that we've been talking about here? And um, what sort of strategies are you seeing going on around the world? And I don't know, UP, you might have a, a role to play in making this happen as well. Nigel, Nigel, Nigel. It's a very difficult question. I'm going to, now my name today is Oprah. So I don't think Oprah answers questions. I'm going to ask my colleague, Juan Moroni, who's online, once did he, if he heard the question, and two, can he jump in and um, participate and perhaps respond to Nigel? One? I need to unmute one if he's um, online, Juan Moroni. Yes, I am online. Can you hear me? Hi. Hi. Yeah, so one is, we're actually seeing one talking, but we're not hearing him. We're not hearing him in the room. Yes, I'm not. Yeah? Uh, we're not to get, we need to get the, so one, if you, if you. Hi. Hello. Hello? Not hearing you any, anymore. Hi. 
はい。はい。Let's just say something. Yes, I am talking. Oh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Hello, Tracy? Hearing you now. Ah, okay, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I can see you. Actually, the camera is on the other end of the room. <laughs> thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you so much for um, to the panelists and thank you so much for, your, for, for the question. As Tracy was saying, yeah, it is indeed a, a complicated question, um, but actually we have some good news on that front. So uh, we have recently launched a project which is called Connect.Post. Uh, which is a project which is intended uh, to connect all the post offices in the world by 2030. So uh, this is pretty much, uh, let's say, uh, answering to the question of, of what the UPU is doing to uh, advance um, connectivity of the, of the postal network. Um, and this is not only to connect the post offices, but but as we like to say, uh, by connecting a post office, we are actually connecting a community. So the main aim is to, by digitalizing and by connecting the post offices to the internet, what we are aiming at is at actually to connect the communities that these post offices serve. And, and as we have heard, um, um, a lot of the post offices are in rural areas, which are, let's say, traditionally underserved or unserved communities. Uh, so there is a lot of potential, not only, so by connecting the post offices, the main aim is also um, to bring these digital services that we have been discussing about to these communities. So uh, I do not want to take more time because I think it's much in more interesting to hear the panelists than myself. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I hope that I answer your question. Answering Nigel's question. Uh, thank you. If I, if I may add sure. to, to what Juan said, uh, so and to speak to your question, I think in, in most countries, uh, the uh, designated operators are still owned by the government. There, you find only a few countries that have privatized the designated operator, but they're typically set up as uh, corporations or companies, including in Ethiopia. Although the ownership is the government's, they're set up as companies. So for example, Ethiopia is a profitable company that runs on its own resources. So I would say this setup uh, is, is quite ideal because uh, the, the, the postal network and the postal operators do get government support, but they're also well placed to finance the kind of capital investments that would be required to for the kind of interventions we're talking about. Sure. So yeah, I think the yeah, I think just everybody quickly, wants to that, Go ahead, um, Yeah, because these challenges around uh, even delivery of, 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 of mail, traditional mail, um, are sort of the same challenges that the telecommunications provide. How, how do you get it to rural communities where it's not feasible to do it? It's not like we have 100 people in this community, it's not feasible for us to, and maybe, you know, they have to come to us. Um, and therefore, I think government has a role to play, even if it's just in regulating. I like the model that Ethiopia has, where it is a corporation, there is government support and so on. I'm sure there's some kind of regulation around it as well, so it's not strictly for profit. Um, and really is a service that's being delivered to everyone universally. So I like the model that, that Ethiopia has. And in Barbados, it certainly it falls under a government ministry. So it's purely government. But um, I think going forward is something that is worth consideration, these kinds of partnerships um, and, and arrangements, basically. Just sort of tying this together, this idea of connectivity, because I know that ITU, for instance, has what is called the Giga Project, which is to connect all schools to the internet by 2030. And so with this idea that UPU is having connect posts, 
I think the idea about sort of bundling the demand together and using a school or a post office as a center for the community to stimulate this demand for connectivity could be a way where collective bargaining could drive down the prices of connectivity. And so especially for hard to reach places such as small island developing states or rural communities, could we use this as a means to address commercial private interests in terms of providing the connectivity and then get to that sort of last mile connectivity element? Yes, yeah, certainly. And I, I have seen in, in, in my country where the um, access center approach does work very well. So if that is extended to the post offices where who are in the underserved areas quite um, extensively, it will really, really work, I think, and bring benefits to those communities that can happen. So there's one more question in the room. I'm just see if I can give online a chance. Is there anyone online who wants to say anything? All right, do you see any hands raised? Someone is talking, or is it me? Yeah, it's me. Yes? Some questions online. Okay, so let me just pause for a second and maybe I could ask my colleague, May Sam, to just give us some interactions and I'll come straight to you after. Can you project this question? Okay, let me, let me make it read them. All right. What role can the postal sector play in facilitating digital identity as a key building block in the digital economy from Michael Palage? What role can the postal sector play in facilitating digital identity as a key building block in the digital economy? And there's another question from Fahma Salimi Kuchi. I think I hope I pronounced that well. How can using IT in the post industry help digital economy growth in developing countries. So you got those two questions, all right? So let me um, go to the panel with that and I'm gonna put my, the mic in my colleague's hand and you'll go next. Yeah, okay. Uh, so to answer these questions, I think in the Ethiopian con context, especially I would like to set it within the framework of uh, the broader digital Ethiopia 2025 vision that the government has set. And in that context, uh, the post is actually considered one of the, the, uh, the key partners in achieving that. And one is around infrastructure, the connectivity bit that we talked about. And secondly, uh, it's uh, the enabling systems. And that speaks to the uh, digital ID and payment systems. And on both fronts, uh, Ethiopia is actually working very closely with uh, the concerned government institutions. We've partnered up with the National ID uh, Project in facilitating both the registration and the distribution of uh, digital ID um, numbers to communities. And, and in this context, also, the post becomes a very critical partner given our branch network, because one of the challenges of, uh, you know, in a country like Ethiopia, where you have uh, 120 million people, most of them living in rural areas, uh, uh, getting people on board uh, for the National ID Project becomes quite a challenge. But given our branch network and our already existing investments throughout the country, it becomes an ideal network for uh, both registering people and getting their credentials across to them. And this, uh, this is also part of our uh, broad their government services uh, uh, package. And secondly, around digital payments, and this also uh uh, speaks to the second question, what uh, are posts doing to digitalize their own services? So in Ethiopia, for example, we've been giving uh, financial services for, for a couple of decades, but these are very much uh, manual bulk payments kind of uh, processes. And we're, we're currently working on digitalizing these payments because we do see the post playing a very important role in that regard as well, also linked with our e-commerce initiative. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've been working in the context of the UPU support to launch uh, uh, as a, um, a domestic and cross-border e-commerce uh, initiative. And as part of that, providing a, a digital payment solution also becomes critical. Um, so uh, in the context of e-commerce, we've been working on, uh, first of all, making sure that all the operational and regulatory issues uh, that are causing a hindrance for uh, full-fledged e-commerce operations in the country are addressed. But we're also looking at uh, trans-border e-commerce in the context of both incoming, outgoing, and transit uh, e-commerce items. For example, we've recently launched a transit e-commerce um, operations where uh, we, we handle uh, packages coming from the rest of the world to the rest of Africa, given the excellent network that uh, our airlines has. So through, through similar initiatives, we, we are working towards enabling trade uh, within the continent, uh, both in transit, incoming, outgoing, as well as the domestic uh, uh, scenario. Um, so 
So that's uh, that's around e-commerce. And, and the one last thing is around e-government services. So when we talk about uh, e-governance, there is a lot of initiative in Ethiopia and elsewhere to make sure that government services are provided online. And in that uh, effort as well, the post becomes an ideal partner because uh, first of all, post offices can serve as one-stop centers for all kinds of government services, where you have, uh, for example, uh, federal, regional, all sorts of levels of government. It will be difficult for people to navigate through the government system itself. And then, as we were saying, it's, 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 uh, it would be ideal to bring the service to the people through the extensive network of branches that we have. So uh, in that regard, we're also working on expanding our IT capabilities, both in terms of infrastructure and human resources to be able to deliver uh, across this. So uh, there, there is a, a lot of uh, areas in which the post would be uh, ideally placed to, to support this goal towards uh, digital transformation. Thank you, you've said everything. So I'll just say <laughs> that um, the, the, the highest level of authentication really for digital identity is, is still in person. So, you know, you can onboard from your bedroom at home, but for, for, for the highest level of verification, it still requires in person. So, so the, the postal services, the communities, which have effectively become service bureaus or can become service bureaus for government, you can do it in your neighborhood as opposed to going to a central location in the city center. So that provides more convenience and really this transformation has to be about more citizen centric and provide services that is more convenient and allows them to be more productive rather than standing in a government department. Um, and the second thing I'll say is that, um, and also for the distribution of the credentials, the, the card itself where, um, where the, they are still you know, hard cards being used, because um, it doesn't have to be, but where the card is still required, the postal service can deliver those credentials. Uh, I would also say if we want to have inclusive digital transformations and we speak to rural communities, you know, some things we take for granted, for example, rural communities, real proper rural communities, many of the households don't have postal codes, uh, many of them are even squatting on land that is not properly registered. But the postal workers know exactly because they're very often from the community, so they know exactly where to find. So whereas like a DHL or FedEx or any of these companies will have a real challenge uh, because there's no postal code or because the, you know, there's, there's been a haphazard development in this community. Uh, the postal workers, because they are from the communities, have a much better uh, understanding of the community and a much better way of identifying and tracking for the delivery of these credentials. Thanks. You want to, okay. Last comment from our colleague. Um, hi everyone, Matthew Matt Norton from the Satyrus Foundation in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, so my question actually builds on a little bit of the last one, as well as uh, Nigel's question about governance. And uh, initially, I was initially the way I was going to ask the question was whether the governance of postal services are fit for purpose for enabling the kind of transformation that. Is, 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 is needed by the users, right? I mean, I think whether we talk about, I mean, certainly in the Caribbean, we've seen this propagation of private service providers that are helping people order packages from all around the world, getting them to the Caribbean. Um, you, Hannah, your, your response a while ago a little bit touched on the second one, which is, you know, businesses, small and medium enterprises wanting to deliver packages and services to the rest of the world. Um, I certainly have a number of friends that have businesses in that latter category that are extremely frustrated with the experience that they receive from the postal service trying to trying to do that. Um, and so I think I think there are a number of we often hear a number of like the plans and the, the things that we ought or we want to be able to do strategic plans, goals 2025, 2030. I'm curious to hear from the panelists. Beyond the plans, what are the things that are most challenging from a governance perspective that hinder your ability to execute the, th the things in your strategy or the things that the services that are being demanded um, of your constituents? Um, thank you. Very good question. So I think uh, with governance, since there are so many different kinds of models that are specific to the 
uh, to the country. I, I can't really speak to all of that, but I uh, but the experience of Ethiopia, for example, where the postal uh, operator is owned by the government, but it's run as a company, uh, I find to be a very good governance model. Uh, why is that? Um, as opposed to you know a typical government institution that's run on budgetary kind of thinking, it gives you uh, the motivation and and also the tools to be able to institute the kind of efficiency that that's needed for the postal network to compete. And eventually it's a very competitive sector that we're operating in where you have uh, both foreign, domestic, uh, private sector players. But I do think that um, under that under this model where it's it's a corporation, you have a, a better fighting chance to institute the kind of uh, culture that will be needed to uh, to be efficient and deliver the kind of service that, that the community needs. And I would say we've had a very good experience in that over the last few years, we've, we've seen our service quality improve in, 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 in double centuries. And, uh, and to your point that, you know, uh, it's easier to talk about plans and targets, but we've, we've uh, over the past years, we've had a very good track record of improving service quality across all the measures and across all of our products. And I think that that's a testament to, you know, if utilized properly, if you have the, that uh, room where it's, it's still government owned, but if, if you have the autonomy to be able to do, to make the uh, decisions that you uh, need to make to provide quality service, it's, it's doable. So I would say the governance, at least under this model is not, is not quite prohibitive for the postal sector to be able to address the increasing demands from the customers. Let me just say that um, from my own experience in Barbados that we were very, very impressed. And in Barbados's case, it is it does fall under a government um, ministry. And so they're all government employees. But we were really impressed because, you know, with COVID, you had very, a very, very short window to, to stand up these services and, you know, create these partnerships and so on. And uh, when we first met uh, with the Postmaster General, it was like, can, can this, can you, do you have the capacity to do this? Says, of course, we deliver thousands of packages every day without a problem. And so said, so done. I mean, of all the services that the government stood up prior to the pandemic, all the digital transformation they were talking about, they got the highest praise from citizens on social media for this particular uh, driver's license renewal because it was brought to their door. This was a real, aha, uh -huh, wow, this is, this, is, this is government. And um, I think from... The point of view that even the public service and we have an initiative called 21st century government so even if it isn't a, 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 a private or quasi private um, corporation there is a real realization that governments themselves themselves have to digitally transform and have to be more responsive to citizens so the notion of an old bureaucratic unresponsive government that is going out the door it has to go out the door if we are really to um, effect the digital transformation so Yuping, you were supposed to be first, but you'll have the last word as we get ready to go to our <laughs> session, our um, main opening ceremony, Yuping. No, just simply to say, I think this is precisely why I think the post perspective for the global digital compact is important. There is that element in global digital compact when we talk about governing digital as a global public good and precisely this explanation and these examples about how government services and delivering to the citizens is possible through post is precisely why I think the input of the UPU is really important in the Global Digital Compact and all of yours as well. Very practical perspectives on how we can use ICTs and the digital uh, Mr. Abu. And really uh, learning the examples of the various uh, countries. Uh, and uh, yeah, so just to say again, it's been an amazing conversation. I really look forward to hearing from all of you at the United Nations as part of the Global Digital Compact. Thank you very much, Yuping. Thank you, Esther Rodney. As I call Esther Rodney, Director of the CTU. And thank you, Hannah, CEO of Ethiopos, for a wonderful conversation and our lightning talk today. Thank you, Trey. Thank you very much, I thank all of you for coming and participating yeah. of our yeah. online. Thank you very much for your engagement and thank you Juan for organizing a session, one of the UPU. With that, I think we'll bring this to a close and let's go on to the opening ceremony. Don't forget you can't bring your devices there. That's what they say, leave your devices outside. Thank you very much, enjoy. Thank you, thanks for coming. Yeah, I'm not